Anyways, welcome. Uh, today's topic is uh, managing complex building envelope issues with tilt-up construction. Uh, my name is Sean Van Rassel and I am the uh, Director of Business Development with Engin uh, Dayton Superior uh, Corporation. Um, I've been in the construction industry for over 30 years and uh, one of the passions that I have are um, I guess you want to say newer methods of construction or, or techniques and uh, one of them is tilt-up construction. Can I see a show of hands how many people here have ever seen a tilt-up job or know what tilt-up construction is? Well, that's great, excellent. So um, go through the presentation. For those of you who um, don't really get to experience tilt-up uh, projects every day, um, this presentation we're going to do is going to uh, introduce you to what tilt-up construction is and then we'll get into the actual uh, building envelope details. Uh, we're doing this in conjunction with the Tilt-Up Concrete Association. The association is a worldwide group that uh, helps uh, promote tilt-up construction, uh, you know, uh, trains contractors with certification to make sure that the construction is done uh, with proper practices and quality control. And their entire uh, uh, process is to just re, you know, educate the, the industry and they've been around since uh, 1986 and um, they've got a, a great program for any contractors that ever want to get into tilt-up construction. They just came from uh, British Columbia where they certified over 160 individuals and companies that uh, do tilt-up construction. So it's uh, an ongoing process to always make sure that tilt-up construction is done uh, safely and effectively. So the video I want to show here is just a, a quick intro to uh, what uh, Tilt-Up is. As a low-cost, low-technology building system, Tilt-Up Concrete Construction has become one of the fastest growing solutions used to meet current industry-wide budget constraints. This is no subtlety. It represents a grassroots insurgency on the part of low-cost technology, fueled by historic economic forces of the Great Recession. If one is to believe the predictions, this is a challenge that may face the allied professions and building industry for some time to come. This dilemma sponsors an obvious question for design professionals. Will design innovation suffer at the proposition of less costly methods of building? Perhaps not. Tilt-up has long been considered an acceptable methodology for everyday buildings and big box retail. It has recently gained a foothold with serious architects as an innovative way of form making. Invented in the last decade of the 19th century by Army engineer Robert Aiken for military purposes, it had flotations by Thomas Edison as an invention, and finally, Irving Gill as architecture. But it took Rudolf Schindler and his now canonical King's Road House to elevate tilt up into a method in which high formal achievement could be pursued. On the cusp of becoming mainstream, it was like many advancements, forced to go dormant until after World War II. Innovations such as the traveling crane allowed it to become the low-cost method of choice for building big box buildings that supported the massive suburban middle-class post-war growth. By the late 1970s and early 1980s, the method had a strong big box stigma that turned off many architects. That is, until recently, World-class architects such as Stephen Hall, Rand Elliott, and Skogan, Elam, and Bray began to engage the technology to create significant works of architecture in the early to late 1990s. A common thread of these great tilt-up works and reason for their impact on the industry is their expression of elements that are uniquely tilt-up, an exploration into the qualities intrinsic to the method. The resulting aesthetic is exclusive and authentic. These buildings and others by significant designers were widely published and recognized, but never launched a movement. That may be changing. The nexus of downward economic pressure on construction costs and the need for accelerated construction schedules have fueled opportunities for tilt-up to morph into new, more complex building types and challenges. Tilt-up's high design pedigree 
Institute's proven track record of flexibility in supporting and manifesting complex spatial propositions and use in executing unique forms have made it the choice of many leading-edge architects. Newer works, such as Rob Quigley's New Children's Museum, the Perkins and Will Design Cedar Ridge High School, and One Hallworth Center, Bing Tom's Sunset Community Center, and most recently, David Chipperfield's addition to the St. Louis Art Museum demonstrate a rejuvenated appreciation for the technology, as well as a fresh approach that is beginning to tap its form-making potential. So go the leading-edge architects. So go the mainstream firms. Today, a wide variety of building types, applications, and explorations are being undertaken with tilt-up technology. Schools, retail centers, libraries, churches, office buildings, hotels, theaters, dormitories, and more are being built with tilt-up construction. No big dumb box limitations seem to remain. Formal experimentation in height, profile, and shape of panels, including curved panels, depth, thinness, endless potential for assembly strategies, apparent or actual visual density through layering, both literal and phenomenal, use as actual structural effect, planarity versus volumetrics, and transparency, to name just a few of the manifestations. Combined, these experiments promise great things. Tilt-up concrete construction's exciting future is not limited to its formal potential. Current industry-wide research into its technological capabilities is underway. In particular, tilt-up technology is a low-cost method for meeting anti-terrorism force protection standards set forth by the Department of Defense is a promising trajectory. This, coupled with rapidly advancing concrete technology, forming techniques, insulation systems, and combined with the above-mentioned recent formal explorations, is beginning to point to new, unimagined directions. For more information on tilt-up concrete construction, including guideline specifications, common details, software, and to locate experts in your area, please visit the Tilt-Up Concrete Association's website. All right, so there's uh, a brief introduction into uh, into the possibilities with tilt-up construction. Uh, tilt-up, keep in mind, is just a method, an alternate method of constructing uh, concrete buildings. It's, uh, it, it's nothing uh, really super unique uh, or changes the type of materials that are designed or used in, in projects. It's just a different way of constructing uh, the building envelope on site. So the first thing we'll go through is the history which is a proven performance for over 100 years in the tilt-up uh, North American market. Uh, as you saw in the video, uh, back in 1909, Thomas Edison uh, was uh, coming up with a great idea, which was, why are we building two forming walls to create one concrete wall? Why wouldn't we just pour these walls down on the ground and tilt them up into position, which was a great idea, and it kind of spurted from there. So it's the process of casting walls or other concrete elements on site and simply lifting them into their final location uh, within that structure. So on-site construction, uh, the elements are then tilted into place. You can see here, this is tilt day. The crane has connected to the panels and is lifting them up off the casting slab and putting them into their final position. The temporary braces are just uh, supporting that uh, wall. Uh, until the structural elements are connected. Uses ready mix concrete, most commonly used building uh, product in the world, and a simple process that uses local trades and the most energy efficient construction process. Your typical wall in tilt up construction, um, in our marketplace, it's going to be an insulated sandwich wall, consists of a load bearing uh, interior wythe, okay, which is cast in the, in the back part. And normally that's between uh, five and eight inches thick, depending on the height that we're going at and what kind of loads are gonna be expected and subjected to. The next part is the insulation layer. 
Um, normally it's somewhere between two and four inches thick uh, in our area, but we have the ability of going up to eight inches thick. And then you have your exterior width of concrete, which is uh, cast uh, face down onto the, uh, the casting slab, and that's uh, usually three inches, and that consists of your uh, architectural features that you want to have on the uh, wall. So to give you a little bit of idea of, of the step-by-step -step process, the panels are formed on the actual uh, casting slab or the building's slab. If, uh, if that is not available to the construction process, then a temporary casting slab is used. Concrete, obviously, being the most fluid building material, you can see it's very easy to form out the outside edges of each of the panels and be able to create things like uh, pointed uh, roofs or arches and different other difficult motifs that normally in a vertical application would be very difficult to uh, form and pour the concrete. So we'll re keep in mind, remember that tilted panels, the edges are the only parts that are really being formed uh, for the concrete, so there's very little building material needed. And the exterior of the panel is typically cast down flat. Now, the next layer is the insulation that we talked about. Uh, like I said, it's uh, usually two to four inches, but we can go up to eight. And the process is that the exterior layer of concrete is cast down, and while it's still in a, in a liquid state, the insulation is placed on top of that, uh, goes edge to edge in the panel, all right? And that obviously eliminates any kind of thermal bridging with solid concrete sections or uh, metallic connectors and other uh, things that could hamper the performance of thermal efficiency. And then there'll be another layer, the structural layer of concrete that'll be poured in, on the back face of this insulation and that is going to uh, sandwich uh, the insulation, basically giving it a fire rating and protective uh, coating on both sides. So the structural layer is then uh, poured. Okay, the electrical conduits can be uh, pre-installed into this, uh, this structural area uh, panel. And for architectural finishes, you either power trowel the back of, of the panel or you could even do some ar architectural motifs and stamped concrete or colored uh, concrete, um, really whatever the owner wants for the, uh, the project. Over 90% of the construction happens down uh, at ground level. So you can imagine that's going to improve on safety and efficiency, especially when it comes to inspection, quality control of the materials that are being put into the wall system. This also helps with speed of construction, the safety, and like I said, the inspection. If an inspector just simply has to walk around and measure uh, concrete cover, rebar placement, or the R value of insulation, it's all just within uh, the first 12 inches off the casting slab. So tilt day, this is an, always an exciting time on a, on a tilt-up project because uh, several weeks have gone by and everything's been uh, put together and constructed at, you know, on the slab. And then when the crane comes in and actually lifts up these elements, it's, it's quite something. People that uh, go to work in the morning and drive by a tilt-up site don't see anything and on their way home, uh, they see the entire envelope of the building standing, uh, it's that fast. So the crane comes in, uh, it can be stationary or, or mobile, uh, picks up the panels, and it's usually about a 20 to 30 minute uh, time between the panel is uh, tilted up off the casting slab and then put into its final position. And the temporary bracing, it can either be done to the interior of the structure or the exterior depending on uh, what the, uh, the framework is going to be or the uh, floors and whether or not the braces would get in the way on the inside or the outside. Now, if anybody's ever uh, seen historically what tilt-up is, uh, you know, a lot of people, first thing they think about is boxes, uh, just simple warehouses, box buildings, nothing too exciting. But I'd say over the last 20, 25 years, tilt-up has really taken the method of construction and uh, ran with it. Um, you can see this is an office building, uh, four, five, six stories is not uncommon. And uh, if anybody's interested, the tallest panel currently on record for tilt-up was set last year, and uh, it was over 110 feet tall. So we're talking about an 11-story panel 
being tilted up and put into place. And it's not just one, it was several on that project. It was, I believe, the University of Miami dormitory. Uh, and then the heaviest panel, uh, well over 300,000 pounds uh, tilted into position. Aesthetics, we saw a lot of uh, examples of this through the video that I showed you, but uh, tilt up really uh, is, is a, a method of construction that allows you to meet those challenging needs from a, from a client. Uh, they, uh, they want a very uh, unique look to a building and they want complex details uh, and, and a look to it. Tilt up is something that can easily be adapted to be able to meet those uh, requirements. The, I would say, newer thing that's been added into Tilt Up in the last 15 uh, or 20 years is putting in things uh, like uh, thin brick uh, assemblies. So this is where the actual uh, clay bricks are, uh, are placed down on the casting slab first, and then uh, the rest of the panel is manufactured on top of that, and when you tilt it up, you get what would have looked like a masonry structure, but it, it's all... Uh, basically a Lego set of uh, brick facade on there. And you can see, uh, you know, the designer here really kind of did a neat uh, uh, process here for the client. Uh, you've got your, your brick looking uh, corner units, and then it's transitioning off, it looks like stucco, and then, uh, you know, it could be aluminum siding here, and then back to uh, brick. And then even with window openings, it's not uh, difficult to change a, a rectangular shaped window opening to a round or oval because the concrete's gonna be poured around that and you don't have to worry about a lot of form pressure. So there's thin brick panel structures, uh, a lot of different motifs. Like I said, the uh, circular openings and archways, this would be very difficult to do in a poured in place application. Uh, this is an act example of actually a curved panel that was done in uh, Ottawa late last year. Uh, not only is it curved, but it's got all of these round circular openings and you can imagine the complexity with trying to do that in a vertical formwork application. Uh, another thing is unlimited form and shape. Uh, because these uh, sections of concrete envelope are not being transported down the highway and they are manufactured uh, sometimes quite large on site, uh, doing things like uh, angled panels uh, or uh, overhangs or flowing top uh, configurations is not difficult to do on site. Panels with large openings, uh, owners like a lot of window space and that's not a difficult thing for uh, tilt up to uh, be modified to adjust and, and uh, accommodate I mean. And uh, we'll go into a little bit more detail on large openings. Manufacturing industrial warehouses and, and structures, uh, it's a very common uh, thing for tilt up. And you can see here's a project that's uh, pretty much just getting touched up, ready to open up to the, uh, the public and very easy to adjust uh, the color scheme for whatever owner ends up coming in the next time in this building. That uh, wall system has become very popular and uh, should actually be considered a lot more often for uh, things like uh, retirement homes, uh, hospitals, places where you, know, you wanna be able to get the most efficiency out of the wall thermally, but you also wanna prevent any kind of uh, freeze-thaw uh, cycles in the inside or mold and mildew from uh, fenestrations. And this is a project that was done several years ago in Sydney, Nova Scotia. And it's almost impossible to actually tell that this is a tilt-up project because of all the different architectural features they put on here. But that is one panel right there and that is another panel right there and the whole system just ties together real nicely. Another thing that's really great with the, uh, the method of construction with tilt-up is you can adopt it to use um, you know, native materials. Uh, the entire building does not have to be done in, in uh, you know, solid tilt-up concrete, but you can add in aluminum features, you can put in some, some overhangs, canopies, you can add wood to it, you can do all sorts of things to make it blend in architecturally with whatever uh, municipality or country or area that you're trying to fit this into. Lifestyle malls are, are obviously a very popular thing and again you can change the architectural features on here to fit in with uh, the area that you want to construct to. 
If you've ever been out to Milton, uh, to the Toronto Outlet Mall uh, at Trafalgar Road in 401, that entire facility was done in tilt-up construction several years ago. Theaters are very easily done. Great for food in, uh, industry where you want to keep the inside uh, sound, uh, solid, uh, able to clean it on a regular basis. Again, beverage industries. It's great for government buildings, museums, uh, libraries. You know, architects can have a heyday with uh, doing all sorts of great features here where, again, it's very simple to do these when you're casting the, uh, you know, envelope on the ground and then tilting it up into place and you don't have to worry about weight restrictions or size restrictions for transporting down the highway. Schools, very popular uh, with tilt-up construction because of the speed. Um, when, uh, usually when schools get their funding for additions or new buildings, uh, usually happens late in the year and obviously the goal is to try to get the structure built as fast as possible and occupied for that next school season. There's one out at Humber College up in Etobicoke or uh, Rexdale that was done several years ago. A couple more of them out in the, uh, the Ottawa area. Uh, you can see here, you can easily see the pink insulation layer in the center of the, uh, the panels. And the, also the myth too, a lot of people uh, believe that um, uh, you know, tilt-up will be hampered because of, of the climate or uh, you know, either winter conditions or bad weather. And the fact is that uh, in tilt-up construction, uh, they get affected the same way that they do with any other construction method. If it's minus 20 or minus 30 out, uh, tilt-up projects are not just shut down, every project is shut down. But uh, keeping an insulated panel nice and warm during the winter months with a layer of insulation is not a complicated thing to do with tilt-up. Uh, right now with the 8 inch thickness, and that's really um, uh, based on the connector tie system that can accommodate up to 8 inches, we're looking at over an R50 in a wall system. Uh, structurally load bearing design. So remember that in most cases a tilt up envelope, that wall system, is a load bearing wall. Okay, so in that um, ease of construction it's going to give you uh, your schedule, your early occupancy, you get the durability from the, from the concrete, sustainability, the safety that most of the construction is done down on the ground level, and it gives you a lot of versatility with the type of openings and look to the building that you can give the client. So why do we use concrete in, in uh, tilt-up construction? It's uh, um, you know, a product that's been around for, for hundreds if not thousands of years. And these are just some of the comments. I mean, it's uh, readily available. It offers fire resistance, soundproofing, durability, offers structural. Uh, thermal mass is something we're going to talk about, the benefits of, of ready-mix concrete. Um, it is a really good product to construct with. And a tilt-up load-bearing wall design, okay, equals performance with your three layers. So here's a nice project where, you know, this is going up uh, four or five stories. The panels uh, around the entire building envelope are being braced from the outside just so they won't interfere with the construction that's going on interior-wise uh, of the building. And you can see they've completely finished the structural elements in here. The floors are all in and the braces are coming off. And as that construction continues down the building, the braces would continue to, to come off. So very, very fast, very efficient. Here's another one. And I also want to point out on this one here, uh, these are temporary casting slabs. So this was a situation where the actual uh, floor footprint of the structure wasn't enough for all the panels to be formed at one time. So the contractor simply used some waste slabs uh, outside of the uh, building envelope to finish off the rest of the panels so that when you bring that crane in uh, you're using it for the you know, most uh, efficiency you can. You're going to tilt all the panels up within a day or two of that process. The structural part of the panel comes obviously from reinforced concrete. Okay, This is an example of a reinforcement cage that uh, was pre-tied and they're just lowering it down into the uh, sections of the panel. Um, but it gives you a good indication of the type of reinforcement that can go into some of these. 
So you can see the insulation layer, okay, um, that's already on top of the exterior concrete layer and now the structural rebar has been placed into the, uh, the formwork and they'll pour the uh, concrete into that. Usually with pump trucks they come in and they can reach a lot of the panel area just from one location and the guys simply pour that as if they were pouring a floor slab. It's very easy. You don't have to worry about a lot of form pressure. You don't have to worry about the safety related to that or scaffolding or guys, uh, you know, hooking on to uh, uh, safety cables way above uh, the ground. Everything's done uh, basically 12 inches off the ground. But it uh, lets you get your concrete from local ready mix. Um, it's a quality that you have. You get thermal mass benefits of ready mix concrete. Your uh, cylinders that you're going to, uh, to get uh, from the concrete mix are tested. These actually have to be tested and broken so that we can determine what the PSI strength is before we lift the panels, okay? There's a minimum requirement for that so the panels don't crack uh, during the tilt. And again, quality control protocol is easily done through this whole entire process. So on tilt day, they connect to the lift anchors that are cast into the back of the panel. Uh, the braces are uh, bolted at the top, ready to go up with the crane. You can see the lift points are located towards the upper portion of the panel, making it uh, naturally bottom heavy, and that allows it to go through its natural tilt process to a vertical position. And then the crane will boom the wall over to either uh, a footing or a uh, uh, foundation, whatever's been, uh, been constructed uh, underneath it and then the braces get pinned back to the floor slab uh, to give it the temporary raise. And the braces are telescopic, so when the final position of the panel has to be made, they either turn the braces one way or the other way to plumb the panels into alignment. Okay, so this is the part uh, that you basically all came to, to hear. It's the energy efficiency uh, of a tilt wall uh, system uh, that uh, focuses in on the air barrier effectiveness and rain screen protection that it offers. So anybody who's been involved with designing uh, over the last couple years knows that the codes are getting much tougher. Um, the requirements and performance for thermal efficiency is, uh, is getting higher and higher. And so everybody's looking for a system out there that can meet these new energy codes and uh, not cost you know, twice as much as the construction method used to be. So identifying the primary elements of, of the energy code, okay, um, the first thing I want to mention is that, you know, what is the energy goal? Um, I kind of wrote this paragraph. It's really the, the focus for, uh, for this. It's the cost-effective construction design that meets the industry energy codes. It provides a comfortable working living environment for the occupants while offering an affordable, sustainable operational cost cycle. So in your building envelope, some of the things that are very important here is we have to pay attention to the R value thermal performance of that uh, system, the air barrier performance of that system, and the maximum opening percentage allowed uh, in the code as well. Now the first thing I want to mention is that a tilt-up wall consists of ready-mix concrete. So it already is a mass wall, and mass walls help you meet the thermal performance or uh, efficiency of thermal design. Uh, what I'm seeing a lot of is that, uh, you know, there's a lot of structures out there that are being designed. Um, they're very low mass, and if there is a temperature swing that has to be adjusted by the HAVAC system, then that HAVAC system has to, you know, the demand for it goes on immediately. There's no delay, there's no buffer, and when you get mass, especially in a, in a tilt-up wall system, you have uh, the concrete there that's absorbing all of this energy and it is your primary buffer when uh, you get temperature swings either inside or outside, primarily outside. Now, there's no way I have time in this presentation to uh, do as good a job as this gentleman here. Uh, John Straub is uh, one of the principals of RDH Building Science, but he's also one of the professors at the University of Waterloo. And John, earlier this year, went across Ontario doing four and five hour presentations on basically uh, deciphering the most recent energy code and pointing out 
parts of design that you could uh, you should look at to improve on the performance of your of your building or your structures. So uh, John went around, like I said, all across Ontario, actually all across Canada, doing these presentations on meeting and exceeding the thermal requirements of the code. And if you're interested in, in uh, his published material, he uh, released this uh, article in April of this year, which goes through the, the new, it's a new guide and it responds to the current needs and tougher codes and focuses in on the uh, early stages of design. So you can kind of catch the problems that uh, you would otherwise find out after the building has been uh, constructed. What I like about it is he does a great job of going through the summary. He goes through uh, the energy codes and standards. He goes through the calculating enclosures and thermal performance and calculating the thermal performance of precast concrete systems. And tilt up is precast concrete systems. So whether it's done in a factory or it's done on site, uh, John's uh, report here kind of encompasses that. So if you're looking for some really good printed material to read um, and it'd be an advantage to you to get this, um, you can either give me a card and I'll send you John's contact information after the presentation's over. So let's look at the code. So the, the, you know, if we look at a graph here, going back to the 1970s, the energy code kind of came out as a baseline of the maximum allowed energy used. Um, and then as you see over time, as the codes were updated, they, on paper anyways, have uh, tried to guide the industry into reducing or creating buildings that are going to use less energy and they're going to be more energy efficient. So if we look at today, okay, on paper anyways, the codes, uh, according to them, there's been about a 40% drop in the allowed energy that's, that's supposed to be used in, in uh, designing structures. But what's actually happened over, over the years is this was a summary that was done of all building types and the way that they're performing and, and the energy that they're drawing on. And unfortunately, they've actually gone the opposite way. In, in the 80s, uh, in the 60s, in the 90s even, um, they've actually, they're performing worse than they did in the past. So there's obviously a disconnect with how the energy codes are being uh, interpreted and how they're actually being um, used in the final design to meet the, the thermal energy codes of, of the building or the, uh, the structure. Anybody who knows that, uh, you know, they're trying to shoot for, I believe it's a 2030 net zero goal. Um, if we keep going on this slope, we're not going to hit there till 3,300. So something really has to change. So first thing we'll talk about is that in Canada, we have uh, obviously our climate zones, um, four all the way up to eight. Uh, but in Ontario, it's, it's five to eight. And if you're designing to meet these, these energy codes, you, you have these three paths that you can follow. You've got the prescriptive method, the trade-off and the modeling. And you know what I normally see is a prescriptive method of design. And that is simply we go through a, a catalog, says we have to build to an R20 envelope, so we're gonna put R20 insulation in that wall. Um, this is the one that's really the biggest disconnect uh, from where the energy codes really wanna go tied in with the trade-off. So we start trading off where we say we're going to overcompensate with um, putting more insulation in wall areas, but we're going to open it up to more window openings percentage. That's a bad trade-off. Um, and you'll see why in a, in a couple slides here. I believe where we're headed is the dreaded modeling process. It's not a method that's really used that much right now, but that's going to be the route that is going to give us the most um, flexibility in understanding how this building is going to perform thermally and the things you can do to uh, get the maximum efficiency out of the design. So we'll look at the prescriptive criteria. So the first one is R value. Okay, um, we have to look at what the, the R value thermal performance of that uh, wall system is. We have to look at the air barrier continuity in there, the maximum fenestration allowed and also the air leakage values 
uh, for that envelope. So in a tilt-up wall system, these three layers provide you everything you need to meet those requirements. So the front end of, of the panel, the face on the outside, you've got your architectural finish. You've got three inches of solid concrete, which gives you your protective air barrier, rain screen uh, ability. If you want to stick with our value uh, prescriptive, you put in your R20 or R18, whatever you, uh, you look up on the prescriptive. And then the wall overall, mainly the inside, because that's the part that's being warmed up in our climate, that is going to give you your thermal mass buffer to any temperature swing that's happening uh, between inside and outside. So let's look at the first one, the R-value thermal performance. So the energy codes are getting very strict, they're getting very specific, and they want continuous layer of insulation. All right. So things like this, where parts of a panel would have possibly had solid sections in it, mainly for, for structural uh, reasoning, those, those are going away. You actually, you have to have a continuous edge-to-edge -edge layer of insulation. So a couple ways that this is done, if, uh, if you look at needing to take an insulated sandwich tilt a panel down to the footing, uh, that can actually go below grade and it's completely uh, encompassing the uh, insulated layer. So there's your continuous insulation. Or you can do a situation like this where you have your uh, foundation insulated and then you place the insulated tilt-up panel right on top. Um, it's a little bit of a leakage in that area, but there is a construction method that uh, does allow forming contractors to form a wall vertically with the insulation in the middle that could line up with where the insulation in the panel is uh, placed for continuity. So thermal bridges, this is the stuff that we really want to stay away from and if you drive down the highway on a, a dewy morning uh, recently, uh, take a look at the next building and see if you can find these white cold spots where, or hot spots where the heat has come through and evaporated the moisture off the building. That's a clear indication of, of thermal bridging. So in the old days, the, you know, everybody was, was, was pitching the fact that, oh, if this is happening to your building, you're just throwing your heating dollars out the window. And that, and that is true to some extent. But the things that are very important to a designer or the long-term performance of the building is, if you start getting condensation building up on the inside of the, of the structure from uh, these bridges, that leads into freeze-thaw cycles, uh, mold and mildew moisture, and basically, uh, breaking down the building from the inside out. So we do not want to see any thermal bridging. Here's what it looks like, uh, the real ugly, if you use a thermal imaging scan. Uh, there's those, those spots, the uh, heat spots that I was telling you, where you can easily see in this kind of wall, there's some kind of steel protrusions going through the insulation layer. The might be a weld plate here. And obviously this joint wasn't very well uh, in, uh, installed and protected from the elements. Here's one example of an improperly insulated uh, you know, building envelope. You can see where the heat loss sections are. And here's, a, here's one that was done fully insulated with no thermal bridging in the actual wall system itself, a little bit around the, the door openings. So our enemies, when we're talking about building uh, envelope enclosures here, is any kind of uh, structural penetration or steel penetration that's going to come through our insulation layer. Um, our worst enemy in most cases is uh, solid concrete balconies that are going from the inside, protruding through the wall system to the outside. And our second worst enemy is, is windows. The technology for thermal performance in windows is just nowhere near the type of our uh, resistance you can get from insulation. So windows really have to be looked at. The percentage of window openings has to be uh, kept to an absolute minimum to get the most thermal efficiency out of your, your wall system. So John Straub, uh, I, I use this slide off of his because this was a very interesting thing. This is where I was saying the trade-off scenario is occurring. So you have a floor elevation here, about eight feet. Um, project specifications say that you have to insulate that to R20, okay? 
So you put that into the wall unit, but you've got a balcony or floor slab that's eight inches solid concrete sticking out. And he says, ask everybody, what kind of effect do you think that eight inch slab has on the performance of that elevation? Anybody want to take a guess at what kind of reduction we're talking about? It's a little bit more than that. It'll take it down to an R9. And then when you start talking about trade-offs, a designer may recognize this problem, but I don't blame them. They might go, well, you know what? We know there's going to be a cold spot on the floor. Let's put our R25 in the wall. And that just doesn't make up for these kinds of thermal bridges that we just did not realize were happening. So John, I don't have a slide on here, the, the, another one that John had, but um, his group has gone and analyzed a lot of buildings that were built in the last 10 years and has found that some of them that were designed to R15 and R18 are coming in at R2.9. And that is why the energy codes are being printed downward, but performance is going in the opposite direction. And the, the, the other problem with trade-offs is trade-offs will allow you to actually know you're going to have a thermal issue and you're going to need to put in a larger HAVAC system to compensate for this. Well, if we're doing that, again, we're, we're now putting in a system that's going to draw even more power to compensate rather than trying to reduce the amount of power we're putting into these buildings. So if we're ever going to get to that net zero design in 2025, we're going to have to start thinking in the thermal modeling scheme and really try to find out where we can save uh, money and efficiency uh, in these building performances. So here's a nice chart John put together uh, which reflects the R value design in the wall and the percentage of window opening and a couple of options here. So you can go with a low efficiency window or you can go to a high efficiency window. Uh, you can go to low insulated wall or a high insulated wall. So let's just take this one right here in the middle. All right, uh, mid-range window performance U value, and we're gonna put an R20 in the wall. So we start with R20, but as soon as we put 20% window opening in, that wall is now performing down around the 11 range. But how many, how many buildings do we see in Toronto or the, you know, the, the big cities where there's only 20% window opening? I mean, we're seeing 60, 70, 80% window opening, and you get down here, there's your R5 performance in the building, and this is his typical curtain wall system performance. Anywhere from that 2.5 up to 4. And, and you just got to change this. Like it's, 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 the, the window parts is, is really hurting the uh, energy efficiency of these buildings. And uh, anyways, to get back on track with, with how tilt up uh, wall system can help with this, Here's a picture here where we've got, as I mentioned earlier, we're meeting that edge-to-edge -edge insulation uh, requirement. There's no solid sections bridging through here. Uh, even the connector ties are non-metallic and have a um, R-value uh, performance basically equal to the insulation, so they're invisible. Um, you can see the section right through here and then we'll talk about the parapet that uh, sometimes sticks up above the uh, the wall system. So here's a cross section through uh, two panels that are coming together at a corner. Uh, one way of doing it is with a 90 degree return on the insulation. Here's your non-conductive connectors uh, through all that. Another way of doing uh, this corner detail is to do a mitered corner and again the insulation goes edge to edge and the only point that there could possibly be a gap is in the actual uh, joint, uh, caulking joint between the two panels. But keep in mind that in, in tilt-up construction, panels are usually in the 18 to 30 foot wide range. So you've only got a joint that has to be caulked and sealed every 18 to 30 feet instead of ones that might be at every eight feet or even closer uh, on there. And then there's things that you can do um, if, if anybody's worried about, uh, you know, the air uh, gap in here and that possibly being a weak link to the thermal efficiency. Um, foam can be sprayed down in here to complete the connection from one to the other. 
Here's what a detail looks like around the window frame. Okay, again, insulation goes edge to edge in the panel, uh, window frame, and then up here on your sill, you've got your slope way for the rain screen uh, principle. You've got insulation going edge to edge. Door frames, same thing. Edge to edge insulation touching the door frame, your drip edge. Now parapets. Parapets are something that usually get missed or have been missed a lot in the past. Um, you think you're getting it covered with the continuous layer of insulation on the outside or on the inside and um, what you end up missing is that there's your pathway right there. All right. That can be uh, solved a number of ways. You can either continue uh, to cap the insulation over the top of the parapet and have that run right into your roof insulation and you can see the effect that that has. You're going to have a 90% reduction of heat loss, uh, thermal bridging through that, uh, that area. Now tilt-up panels uh, make that detail very simple. The insulation that's in the middle of the panel goes all the way up to the top, but you can cut the structural layer of concrete on the panel down to match up with the elevation of your roof insulation. And so that way your roof insulation just sits right on top of your panel insulation and you have completely closed off that thermal bridge area right there. Yes, sir? Uh, if the uh, balcony slab is such a problem in terms of thermal bridging, why can't we pull it out of a structural in, uh, piece of insulation like no So, so you, you, you question about the, the, the balconies being, uh, you know, obviously a, a killer spot for, yeah. you know, the, the, the thermal bridging and can we use insulation in that or some? It's not that simple. Uh, there, there are some solutions to that uh, that have come out of Germany in the last 15, 20 years where they've actually created a um, insulation box that has rebar that goes through the insulation box that will connect the inside and outside balconies. But there's still thermal bridging occurring through the rebar, steel rebar materials. So what we're starting to see designers do is thinking outside of that box and, and where they can do it, and it's acceptable architecturally, is um, they may have actually separate shear walls outside of the building where the balcony is bolted to the, the shear wall outside of the insulated canopy of the structure. And that way, there's, it's not even going through the wall system and causing any thermal bridging. It is a completely separate structure outside of the insulated wall uh, assembly. So, there's things like that that can be done. Um, there's also, you can use better materials that aren't as uh, uh, conductive. Like black steel, you can use, what's that? Right, and that's what I was gonna say. So, so stainless steel, um, if anybody doesn't know, but uh, some grades of stainless steel have, have one quarter of the thermal bridging uh, or uh, conductivity as black steel. And there's also things like uh, GFRP uh, reinforcement, um, which you know now you're getting to the fiberglass material, which is very similar to the non-metallic connector systems that are using well. So those are things that designers can look at to improve upon uh, problematic bridging issues right now. Uh, even exterior canopies, uh, you know, putting these on buildings and then and then having these go up. Usually they're bolted uh, big steel assemblies that go through the insulation layer and get bolted to the, the, the steel structure on the inside. In a lot of cases, uh, the weight of these can be held by just that three inches of exterior concrete that's outside of the insulation. But if the loads do get high enough where the assembly, the bolt connection has to go through and anchor into the structural width, a um, little hard to see, but there is actually a notation right up there to use uh, I think it's 304 stainless steel. Again, just improving on the design and putting in a product there that's going to keep your thermal bridging down to a minimum. Okay, the next thing we want to talk about is the air barrier influence. Um, this is obviously very important to the efficiency. And, you know, John puts all sorts of, of different types of uh, construction materials that we see every day. There, there's wood and masonry and block and, and steel studding and everything. And they do have all their answers 
and solutions to trying to meet these new energy codes and things like uh, air barrier continuity. But you just need to be aware of how complex some of these can get and then the difficultness with trying to maintain uh, these uh, long term, okay, performing long term. Again, in an insulated sandwich uh, tilt up uh, panel, uh, everything is in one. You've got your structural layer, your insulation uh, layer, and your exterior uh, protective architectural layer. All in one, doesn't need a cavity uh, section in there, an air uh, void, uh, as a lot of other systems do. And under the code, uh, building envelope uh, for the air barrier, a cast in place or precast slash tilt up concrete complies with the section that uh, it has the air permeability of 004 or less. So it is a natural air barrier. And the US Army Corps of Engineers uh, did several tests uh, years ago and uh, they summarized that a tilt up insulated uh, wall system or even just a solid tilt up wall system uh, outperforms most of the buildings they tested and the results in, uh, in their report here was that it was 10 times greater than the minimum requirements. So just a quick picture, this is the joint that's being cocked and sealed between two panels and this is just simply a horizontal reveal, uh, architectural reveal and they are just simply cocked to the same uh, standards as uh, a lot of other construction products, uh, masonry or precast panels are, are cocked and sealed. And that's usually a backer rod with the sealant on the outside, a backer rod and sealant on the inside. And I have seen some details where they're calling out for a secondary caulking behind the primary because we all know that primary could fail five, ten years from now. And if any wind or pressured uh, water gets in here, it'll simply hit the second barrier run down and out the weeper at the bottom of the joint. Windows go in and, and are uh, cocked and sealed, uh, same specifications. That finishes off your air barrier performance around the window openings. And then the last part is managing that maximum fenestration area. As I said earlier, the window openings are a killer. But under the code, there is an allowance that says the vertical fenestration shall not exceed 30% of the gross above grade wall area unless 50% of that conditioned space is within daylight zone, visible transmittance is greater than 1.1 solar gain, um, and you install automatic daylight controls uh, in those areas. But then even from that, you can only go up to 40%. So the ones that you know, we see downtown Toronto that are 60, 70, 80% glass, um, anybody who's ever lived in one of those or worked in them knows that it's, uh, you know, you're either microwaved during uh, the day or you're freezing uh, during the winter months. Um, so they've really got to improve on those. So in the tilt up design, again, there's no maximum. The spandrels provided um, behind the window, you can actually put it in so yeah, you can still get that glazing look from the outside, but you're not getting that uh, uh, reduced thermal effect happening on the inside. The other thing is, since the uh, tilt-up panels are all reinforced, it's very easy to install different configurations of window openings and really reduce the percentage and meet that code requirement. And the other thing is, uh, as they're being load-bearing, they also allow the opportunity for a supported roof um, floor integration of horizontal or slope glazing uh, up at the top of them. So I showed this illustration earlier. There's a really neat uh, example of how, you know, just moving windows around and uh, you can reduce the percentage of openings, but you can still get all that light that you need uh, inside the building so people don't feel like they're living or working in a cave. So what questions have brought us up uh, here today? So what can you learn from what we've presented? Uh, what experiences do you have with energy codes? Do you think of building with tilt-up uh, wall systems for an energy solution? And where can you turn for more information? So I want to finish off by thanking everybody for coming to this, uh, this presentation on this. I hope you found this uh, useful. If uh, you are looking for some additional resources, 
Uh, there's myself uh, that works uh, work for Dayton Superior. But the Tilt-Up Association has a lot of resources. There is a lot of local engineers and architects that have uh, done projects and continue to do projects in Tilt-Up construction. And there's also a system called uh, TiltWorks Design Software, which will uh, allow designers to simply uh, put in uh, you know, the uh, building information. And what it will spit out is all of the panel information. Uh, the stresses on the panels are calculated. The materials are calculated. Uh, construction individual panels are uh, given as an output. And even for uh, the contractor, a complete material takeoff list for the reinforce, reinforcement and concrete volume is in there. And that's just an example of the geometric data input for this. But it's an online design software system. So as you input all of the project parameters and then you log off, you save all of your data. And then the next time you log in and upload it, you can start off where you left off uh, on that. And that's some of the material that goes into one of these insulated well systems. So do we have any questions uh, that came up or anybody experiencing uh, building design right now where they're not happy with the performance or? Yes? What about cost effectiveness versus other methods of construction? Well, tilt-up method is, is very comparable in cost. It, it gives you the, like I said, there's, you've got your three layers all in one. So you, um, if you're looking at other construction methods, what you have to do is you have to uh, pool all of the material costs together or the labor costs associated with that method of construction and compare it to what a tilt-up wall system can give you. So a prime example of that would be a, a tilt-up uh, insulated wall system is usually load-bearing, first of all. So in a lot of um, construction designs, the roof and floor loads are connected right to the back of the panel. And those is where the, the load transfers are. So you, if you're looking at that kind of cross comparison, you would, have to, um, you would have to look at all the steel you're saving from other construction designs, whether it be masonry or precast, that would need to be bolted on to structural steel elements. So if you compare those two, it's very comparable. What, what the industry really likes about tilt-up is the speed, the efficiency, the simplicity of it. And 90% of the construction happens on ground level before you ever tilt the panel up. And when it comes up, I mean, it's done. As soon as that wall comes up, it's insulated, it's fire rated, and it's ready to go. So as soon as you can get your, your windows in and the roof, you can start heating that structure for all the rest of the subtrades to come in and finish up uh, all the rest of the uh, interior construction. How much, <coughs> how much schedule acceleration overall might you anticipate for like a large warehouse? Like is, is it material compression of the, the construction cycle? Or it's, it's, um, a it's a very, it, that, that's a very open-ended question because <laughs> the, the speed of, of tilt of construction um, a a tilt-up contractor can show up on site tomorrow and start forming panels in a week or two. So where you're trying to stage most of your traditional construction practices for a shoot date, um, this is where tilt-up can get in early and get things started right away. It does take a little bit of um, understanding that in, in a tilt-up project, some stages are going to be reversed. Like a lot of times, uh, say a warehouse, the floor doesn't go in till the end. But in a tilt-up project, you would want to design the floor in first and then use that as your construction uh, you know, surface. And, uh, and usually that takes a little bit of getting around to. And then even your structural steel. A lot of times the structural steel is the, f the next part after the, the, uh, the foundation. But with a tilt-up project, your steel would be third or fourth thing that would be showing up on site. So, there's no doubt tilt-up is very quick and efficient. It's, um, it's about getting on board with the with tilt-up construction process so that you can completely understand where you're going to gain time, money, advantages on design for the owner, or whatever it is you're trying to look for. What's the cure time? 
cure time. Uh, panels can actually be and have been uh, made poured the day before and tilted the next day. So in most, uh, in most panel designs, uh, the compressive strength we need to prevent cracking during lifting is in the 17 to 20 MPA range. So uh, normal construction scheduling for tilt-up is the panels are formed and poured and it's about a week to two weeks later when uh, the crane comes in and starts tilting them all up. But that's just, a, that's just a normal construction method. If it needs to be accelerated, it, they can be formed and tilted within 24 hours. You just get high early. Yeah. yeah. Yes, sir. Correct. Yeah, so, so there, this is one of the reasons that we're, we're out promoting all of the aspects of tilt-up construction in Ontario. If you ever get a chance to go to Western Canada, tilt-up is one of the most dominant construction methods in, in all of Canada. And I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't expect that it, uh, I, be, I bet you it represents at least 15, if not 20% of the uh, ICI construction in British Columbia is, is tilt up. And it's been that way for about 20 years. The, the, the thing in Ontario that I found is, like, tilt up has been in Ontario for over 35, 40 years. And there's over 200 structures throughout the province that have been done in tilt up uh, method. Um, what we're finding is that this marketplace has just been um, defaulting to what they know. And if you want to build a vertically poured in place, ready mix concrete wall, you bring in forming contractors and you hire a general contractor. Um, if you want to do a, a project in masonry, you hire a masonry contractor. So this whole, um, this whole thing that, that John Straub and myself and, and anybody who's been involved with tilt up construction is doing is we just, we're going around and we just want to re-educate the Ontario market that there's a very uh, trustworthy, historically proven um, construction method that is going on every day in North America that is just not being utilized to what I believe it should be utilized to in the Ontario market. And we all know what the pressures are. In the, you know, we always hear lack of labor, we can't get a hold of a sub-trade, I'm, I'm only, you know, I, if I do get a hold of a sub trade, he can't start for six months. Like, these are all things where tilt up shines on because some of these projects, um, I didn't really, you know, mention this, but some of these projects, you know, 100,000 square foot warehouse can be formed, uh, poured, erected into place with a crew of eight guys. And it's used with local, local trades, um, except for a certified tilt up supervisor project manager, the rest of the guys that are placing rebar and the ready mix concrete can be general labor, trained, trained on site. So it's a, it's a method of construction that can move anywhere in the province and use local trades and make it work. It, it's, it's really not that complicated, but the Ontario market just has not heard about it enough to, to say, let's go, let's do a lot more of these things. So I challenge anybody in the room, the next time you're, you're looking at a job, to seriously consider it in tilt-up construction. I think you're going to be amazed. Yes, sir. Do you have, we do a lot of um, structural school design for the whole assortment of boards around the GTA. And school design is pretty set in stone, concrete blocks, a cast slab, conventional steel roof, et cetera. And they're, most of the school boards are really not open to looking at alternative construction methods. Even the ones that do, they tried something 10 years ago or 15 years ago, and they said, You're, you're sitting beside the gentleman that could tell you an awful lot about it from Ottawa. So the, the school board, I agree with you. The school board, uh, depending on the municipality you're working with and private, uh, public, um, 
it, it, it can be a challenge, and I agree with you. Some are set in their ways, but there's others that also realize that funding for schools, additions, and new, new school projects, the, the money's not there uh, like it used to, and they're trying to get the biggest bang out of it as they possibly can. Um, if, you, if you leave your contact name with me, um, Len from Tiltwall, Ontario, he's actually in the, in the concrete section, um, he's done several schools across the province, and he actually has uh, the case study of construction costs, and he also has a school of similar size constructed in the old method, and a, cons of a, and a school of the same size constructed in a tilt-up method with a, this tilt-up wall system, and he shows the 50 or 60 percent reduction in energy consumption. So there's, there's more to think about than just the, the construction cost, but it will meet it on the construction cost. But the school board's also looking for long-term performance. And if you can reduce the, the energy consumption by 50, 60 percent, that, that's something they're going to start paying attention. Listen, if, they, if they're hung up on masonry and block, tilt-up can give them that. There, there's the architectural features that can be added to the tilt-up wall. When it tilts up, it looks like a masonry building. So that can be given to them. But it's the rest of the wall that, that uh, they need to start paying attention to and, and how it could really um, give them the, the, the performance and, and lower operating costs that they're looking for. So, yes? You said that the um, case for the, uh, the precast on the slab in the interior, so you were talking about having the slab poured first. Yes, so, so, the, so the casting slab on the site you get a lot of comments about, well, I have a situation where I'm going to put a, project, a building up, whether a warehouse or something, and I don't know who my client's going to be. So I, I don't want to put the floor slab in. That's fine as well. Uh, there was a couple of uh, pictures I showed up there where um, if the floor slab's not available, then a temporary casting slab's put on site. And it's not a, it's not a big deal. It, it's, it's two to two and a half inches of just non-reinforced concrete finished on, on, on the ground, and that is the casting slab for the panels. And when it's done, that all gets broken up and recycled at the concrete plant. Or they can design that to be part of, say, the parking area or an outside playground or something like that. So there, there's, if you talk to a tilt-up contractor and you, you, you point out ahead of time what the restraints are, they will give you options and work around that. It does not have to be cast on the floor slab of the building. But it's preferred because that's part of the building that's going to be there already. And that's, that's what they need, so. Okay. Excellent. Well, thank you very much.